a very good morning to everyone today on the occasion of uh, birthday of uh, the founder manali momaya we are uh, starting a new lecture series on the history enthusiasts uh, uh, group and the title of the uh, lecture series is the history of indian women uh so our first resource person in this lecture series is uh, uh dr shahida murtaza ma and uh, she will be talking on the title rights of women in islam so it's a privilege to have you on the platform of history enthusiast ma i warmly welcome you uh to the board and uh, i also welcome all the audience who are joining us uh please support us stay active throughout the lecture and uh, i also welcome co-host uh, of this session uh, ms manali momaya now i request ms manali momaya to introduce our today's resource person uh, dr shahida murtaza ma thank you thank you very much nadi um i feel ecstatic actually uh, this is a coincidence uh, the lecture happens to be on my birthday and uh, uh, i feel really happy and i also feel honored to be introducing dr shahida ma'am uh, she has an msc in anthropology and a doctorate in reproductive health from the department of anthropology karnataka university dharwad she has served in four universities in different capacities as a researcher and as a teacher for the last two and a half decades she has been actively involved in gender issues her areas of academic interest are gender concerns in reproductive health human rights development in unorganized sector she has keen interest in muslim women's issues and trying to gauge the difference between the text and the context she worked on several projects on issues pertaining to women both in rural and urban areas uh, she has been contributing to feminist scholarship through her writings and discourse she has to her credit four books and several research uh, papers she has participated and shared her scholarship at various international uh, forums such as montreal canada madrid and uh, bonn uh, also berlin uh, usa etc dr shahida is on several boards and academic bodies both in india and abroad she is presently serving as a professor in women studies and director at the center for women studies in maulana azad national urdu university hyderabad uh, she also has served as dean uh, school of arts and social sciences and also a uh, joint proctor uh, dr shahida held the responsibility of central public information officer uh, rti and chaired the committee against sexual harassment uh, it is really an honor to have madam on our platform today and uh, we are looking forward to this uh, lecture and uh, learning a lot from her thank you nidhi for giving me this opportunity thank you every i now request ma'am to begin the lecture yeah uh, i'm really glad connected to his youngsters you know and uh, i really want to congratulate manali and uh, nidhi for starting this enthusiastic group of enthusiast and uh, you have been very very active i can see it i'm not from history maybe i'm not devoting much time to your group uh, but since you have requested me to do this work i thought uh, let me share some of my thoughts on this and uh, it's a wonderful day that you started with uh, uh, manila's birthday and uh, i don't know how many women are there in the group i would like to really uh, congratulate you youngsters can contribute a lot to the existing knowledge with the novel ideas and uh, reaching to the people who are at home and uh, also the people who have retired and sitting uh, no more active in the academic circle otherwise like teaching and all this way you you are uh, you know whole work will get enriched because of the rich experiences and uh, i feel that um, what you're doing is good and all the best wishes for all of you for taking up this course and uh, 
let us hope that we meet few of you in Bijapur. Maybe online those who are uh, um, we will be watching on YouTube. Quite a few may know me because I have served in Karnataka almost 20 years uh, in Karnataka University, in Gulbarga University, in Bijapur University, and then I came over here. So um, there's a wonderful opportunity, and thank you for that. We are starting with uh, uh, a historical, you know, like uh, view, and then the present situation or whatever it is uh, of Muslim women. They write in Islam because I would like to tell you first and foremost is what we see in the community may not be reflective of the actual religious tenets or what religion has given uh, to the women or to the men, their rights and responsibilities and, uh, you know, all those things. Because usually when we see the community, we feel, oh, they do not reflect the equal equality, equity and justice is not provided to the uh, women or to the men, maybe, whatever. So what do we have to always look at the community practices with a pinch of salt? So we have to go back to the original sources to understand actually what is given, why there is a huge gap often you find uh, because I am uh, coming from a community where I can see that there's a huge hat is between what the text is and what context is. I mean, actually what is being practiced. So it is very much, um, you know, uh, what you call it becomes very necessary that we discuss uh, what the sources are saying about it and where is the fault lies with whom the fault lies why it is not in total being implemented in this society. So I don't know whether I am trying to share my thoughts, I mean, my paper with you, but I may not be able to I have been trying. Uh, can you hear me at least? You can see me also. Manali? Uh, yes, yes ma'am, ma we, we can, can hear you. you. Okay, so I'll start with status of women in Islam. I'm giving a cursory glance, I am throwing, not that in detail. And uh, I would like to say that the rights of an individual, uh, if you want to look from their uh, religious sources or their real life also, we have to see few areas which are very, very important. That is whether a woman, since we're dealing with women, women in the particular faith who are attached with the faith or who are in the community, whether they enjoy the rights of few, or, you know, rights like right to marry, the right to enjoy the choice in marriage, whether she has a right to select her mate. Second thing, whether she has a right to divorce, whether she has right over property, whether she has right over her own earning whether she has she has right over her children, whether she has right to education. These are very, very, very important aspects of our life where we want to have control over, which gives our identity, which gives us independence, which liberates us. Let us see actually um, what, what a Muslim woman stands, how the Muslim woman stands in the community also with her, her status presently in the community reflects her true status what is propagated what is proposed you know like what is pro uh, given in the religious texts or for that matter since we are the believers in prophet whether his life reflected what is expected of a society or a community are we really following the footsteps of the man who tried to walk up talk what Quranic verses says? Because since we're talking about Islam, Quran is the revealed book for us to be followed. And since it is like in Arabic, the life of the Prophet is also as a practical thing what is taught in Quran. And he lived a life. Whether we reflect back upon, whether we try to uh, you know, go back to his life and turn the pages of his life, what is written, whatever is there, whether he behaved the way he treated his women in his life, his wives, his mother, or his girl children. We have to have that if we are the followers of that. But alas, I can say to you that 
there is a huge gap in many of the households we see that they do not reflect the actual you know like um, spirit of islam or the life of prophet uh, you know like how he led a life or how he treated his women we are far you know remote from that so let us see what actually and start with the quranic verse which said o mankind keep your duty to your lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate of same kind that is in chapter 4 verse 1 that he might dwell with her in love that means he has provided you a mate within you are human kind so you have to be good to her so that you will have peace of mind you will live happily with her this and then i will go back after this words having read from the quran i'm quoting in my lecture all through some of the quranic verses which are reflective of women's status which is due to her see if i am not enjoying the status what is actually in the quran given in the life of prophet who taught us how to live that means my society my men maybe my family is failing to provide me all the rights which are entrenched in my religious texts so not to blame the religion and not to blame the text not to blame the faith it you have to blame the patriarchal society around the patriarchal family around the men around who are failing to provide me the status which is very much given in my religious texts so let us have a look at prior to islam what was the prior to you know emergence of islam what was the status of women you know islam emerged somewhere in 6 7 8 6th century i mean 7th century ad in the middle of a divided tribal semi nomadic society there were lot and lot of you know like tribes you know no arab of late it became maybe past 40 50 years that it has uh, developed as one of the you know like middle east has become a very um, uh, what you call uh, economic uh, you know center for the world to come and invest and people like us to go and earn earlier it wasn't like that it was a dry patch of land which which produced not a single you know like grain it was a semi nomadic society entrenched with all type of vices prior to islam with the advent of islam the society underwent a tremendous change islam was able to bridge these barriers and division of ethnicity there were many many tribes islam tried to bring them together they were divided on ethnicity they were tri- uh, divided on language they had the pedigree they had very much proud to their you know forefather that they belong to that particular tribe so they used to be always war like situation and also the place and create the first truly global community and civilization language and places were also divided and this islam uh with the advent of islam it tried to bridge the gaps and the barriers you know between them and they became a truly globalized community global community and civilization to rule over and cursory glance over the social condition prevailing during pre islamic society would help us understand the extent of impact uh, influence islam on the community at large and on marginalized section of the society in particular women you know that time slavery was very very common uh, everybody had slaves and then slaves were treated you know like of course they were like purchased like goods they were sold in the market like goods and uh, most of them were black you know people were from africa and whatever the tribes they belong to for thing they were sold and each one would have 5 to 6 10 depending on the richness of you so women were uh you know uh, very badly treated slaves were treated minorities and the often sent upward the widow to name a few islam through its teaching condemns strongly any type of human rights violation i tell you when we read quran i found as a third person reading a text which is a revelation of god that every step every chapter we find somewhere or the other there is a mention of rights of individual human rights animal rights 
plant ka life you have to water the plant give water to the you know uh, animals who are hungry thirsty you know all that everywhere it is there not only at immediate family and kinship level also we have been instructed to take care of but to all the members of the community the umma we call it umma i mean each uh, together a muslim community or muslim all over global level we call it umma 1500 years ago the society was reeling under the influence of uh, vices such as uh, you know alcoholism alcohol used to flow like water in each household they had plenty of women womanizing was common female girl children were to be buried alive and i tell you this practice was so 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 common prevalent so rampant that everyone when you know many men when they converted when they adopted the thoughts of prophet muhammad they started crying bitterly when he when he said that burying alive your girl children you are unsuitable after that when he brought the realization to them they cried bitterly that we did really wrong with our children we used to bury they used to worry it was very practice some say that they have seen even the graveyard where the girl children are buried still it is there in jada women enjoyed no status whatsoever they were mere objects of shame they were mere sexual objects they had neither voice nor any type of rights women had no share in the property and widows were treated inhumanly it was time honored custom to during the pre islamic period to treat women as objects rather than humans uh, they were telling one of the um, you know like a uh, person my friend of history that uh, earlier when a, a woman's husband died Uh, after a particular period of iddat of 40 days or whatever like they used to bring her on the you know what you call chaurasta or the crossroads and they used to fill her pallu with the dung of the you know like uh, animal cattle in her pallu they used to put all the dung on the main roads crossroads was standing over there they said why did they do that it reflected it symbolizes that no one words this lady is ready to consummate anybody she is free to you know have sexual relation with anybody on the road so this was so badly treated women had absolutely no right uh, there were four kinds of biological relationship when we got sexual relationship or conjugal relationship we can say biological relationship between the males and the females they were a form of marriage there used to be one form of marriage in which a man would propose for and marry another's daughter or depend by giving a certain dower okay somebody's daughter or dependent a man would approach and say that i am ready to marry by giving certain dower this is one type this was one type of marriage second was a man desiring a noble offspring would ask his wife to call in the house a noble man and be get an issue through that man this was a second relationship biological relationship or sexual it course they can have the third was a limited number of persons less than 10 and okay um what they would do would visit a woman and after the birth of a child the woman would fix paternity out of those persons and the man would be bound to accept the child what a silly way of doing it there were prostitutes who had a large number of visitors if a child was born to any of them paternity would be decided on comparing the appearance of the child with any of the visitors in brief women had no social cultural political or any type of rights that means she was devoid of all type of rights as a human this uh if this type of thing reflects the lowest 
you know, position women, uh, you know, had during pre-Islamic era. She was mere a piece of an inanimate property. Prophet Muhammad was the first human who brought dignity, grace and meaning to the life of women under Islam in the 7th century in that. Reforms in women's rights affected marriage, divorce, and inheritance. You know, the reform, reforms brought such a brilliant status, such a brilliant change in the lives of women. You'll be surprised to see, and you'll be shocked to know, madam, what you're talking, we don't see in many of the households in the community. That's why I started with a positive note and with the clarity that what you see in the community, don't see that this may be a reflective of a religion. Most of the religious practices for that matter, whether it is Hinduism or we say Manusmriti is your religious text, but it is not for me, Veda is the religious text. So what we read in there, we don't find. What we read in you know, Manusmriti, we find in the community. So this type of thing we have to, as a history enthusiast, as scholars, as scholars of women's studies or anybody with academic excellence should have to go for the, you know, genuine sources and try to reflect upon that where we are going wrong. Is the community mistake or religion per se is giving this type of status to women? Okay, that that has to be very because most of the misunderstanding, misconceived ideas, what are being floated in newspapers, in the news or everywhere in the media, I feel that they do not reflect the true Islamic spirits. They are, they are, they are not aware of what Islam is teaching. They have been misguided by few of the things which are happening by the patriarchs, you know, who are creating this evoke. So it is very much, uh, you know, compulsory uh, on our path to really go through, read and then make a statement or talk about it or reflect upon before we go further in, uh, you know, like um, dividing the society in the name of religion or faith. So in Islam, what is it now? I'll just run through because you've given me very limited time, but I'll take let it maybe a little more and then reflect upon what actually the faith has to say about a woman's status. In the religion of Islam, a woman is an independent entity. Please believe me, we are independent. And why I'm saying what you see the dependence on men, in what way it is dependency, in what way I'm independent, try to understand that. And that's a fully responsible human being. Because I'm independent, I'm also responsible human being. You know that with independence comes some responsibility. It's not that you have been, you know, independent individual and you're not answerable to, you're not responsible, you're not at all responsible towards anything. It is utterly wrong. I have been given the uh, post of a vice chancellor. That means it is an independent post, you may think, but I have huge responsibility. As a mother, I'm not independent. As a worker, I'm not independent. I, it comes with some responsibility. Islam also addresses her directly and does not approach her through the agency of Muslim males. Please watch it. Please underline it. A woman would assume full capacity and liability once she has attained maturity and has received the message of Islam. Till she is a minor, she may be listening to her father, she may be under the care of parents or brothers. But later on, when she achieves the majority, she is responsible and she assumes full capacity and liability. What makes one valuable and respectable in the eyes of Allah? the creator of mankind and the universe is neither one's prosperity, position, intelligence, physical strength, nor beauty, but only one's Allah's consciousness and awareness that we call it taqwa. This makes you higher or lower in your status. That is how much you are, you know, conscious of God. And, his, and aware of his presence, you know, then only your deeds will be, uh, you know, checked. That you should have the belief and you will never go astray. It is important that we try to ascertain the status of, them, status of women 
has is enshrined in the holy quran also briefly highlight the spiritual social and economic aspect of it it is very very important that we check how much right is being given uh, in the sphere of economy in the sphere of cultural life in the sphere of uh, you know socio cultural life rather family ties family life so let us see the spiritual so social and economic aspect where the women stands women according to the quran is not blamed for adam's first mistake actually they say it is hawa who is guided adam this is not true both are jointly wrong in their disobedience to god both repented and both were forgiven this is in quran chapter 2 verse 36 chapter 7 verse 20 to 24 in one verse in fact 20 chapter 20 was 121 it specifically says adam specifically was blamed for the mistake the quran provides clear cut evidence that women in completely equated women are completely equated with men in the sight of god in terms of her rights and responsibilities the quran states every soul will be held in pledge for its deeds not for husband's deed for not for children's deed for not for other deeds quran chapter number 7 four verse 38 every soul will be held in pledge for its deeds it was common socially accepted practice among arabian tribes to bury their daughters alive which i mentioned earlier the quran forbade this custom and considered it a crime like any other murder god has revealed and sent the prophets wherever the crimes or any human practices increased in the communities or in the societies that's why he sent lot of prophets and he the prophet muhammad was sent in late 6th and 7th century when arab tribes were reeling under the worst conditions worst in the sense the treatment towards women the treatments towards slaves the treatment toward a human being the treatment toward animals the treatment overall was worse than animals then the prophets you know brought the true light and to do what you call equity equality and justice to each one individual there it is respect to of you know tribal uh, association or uh, or the women or as women as wives as daughters or mothers you know they been given full fledged rights on par you know like men in some ways maybe little less that we will come to it later and when the female in fond buried her life is questioned for what crime she was killed Quran chapter 81 verse 8 to 9 and when the female in fond buried her life will be questioned she will be questioned for what crime she was killed criticizing the attitude of such parents who reject their female children even today uh, my friends all of you are aware female feticide so so very common we are going back to the days of pre islamic era where there was no faith you know which could contain their irresponsible ways of life murdering girl children alive burying them alive there are so many cases we be we as a muslim we have read and with proofs you know like it was so inhuman even to talk that see we had sati burning the widows alive with the husband we have still widows you know not marrying widows and then mundan and uh, we a widow brahmin widow leads a life that we have a uh, uh, sati prata to tha we have devdasi system then we have now uh, infanticide and feticides we don't want our girl children to see the day of the life why are we not going back to the days of those tribes why we are educated we are richer we are sophisticated so called and civilized are we the census of india 
really it mirror images your thoughts where we stand today government has to intervene to say that not to kill your girl children why for we are doing that because of the patriarchal practices way back i'm talking about 6th to 7th century and today here's 20th century that things have not changed much okay we have uh, we have invented many more methods to kill her they used to kill after birth we are doing it within the womb of the mother when whenever the news is brought to one of them of the birth of the female child the man's face would get darken and he was filled with inward grief he he used to cover his face and roam in public just to say that yes i have be, i have i have become a father of a girl child it was so shameful an act we shame does he hide himself from his people because of the bad news he has had shall he retain her or sufferance or contempt or bury her in the dust ah, what an evil choice that is said on chapter number 16 verse number 58 and 59 from quran far from saving the girl's life so that she may later suffer injustice and inequality islam requires kind and just treatment for her among the saving sayings of prophet in this regard are the following i quote ibn hanbal whoever has daughter and he doesn't bury her alive prophet said this and quoted by ibn hanbal his friend his companion does not insult her who so ever has a daughter he doesn't bury her alive does not insult her and does not favor his son over her god will enter him into paradise why we do the good deeds why do we worship god why do we give alms why do we do puja why do we do charity our whole whether is a muslim christian or we we want to enter into paradise but to keep up a god happy so what is said whoever saves his daughter will enter into paradise who said prophet said and his companion records it at the number 1957 that is that is the 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 para number 1957 mohar allah the exalted states in the holy quran concerning the necessity importance of the preservation and care of the newborn children the very sight of the child chapter number 17 verse 31 says and kill not your children for fear of poverty la taqtalu auladakum laqashati imlah we provide for them and for you surely such a thing is great sin such a killing is a great sin kill not your children for fear of poverty we abort our children oh who will take care of it as if you are the provider you fear of their pro- you know like how to go, how you are going to provide who is providing you who is providing to the birds they go in this stomach from there they come back fill and sleep on the branches of the tree who provide for the animals do they have kirana shops do they have provision stores in the jungle no you kill your children especially the girl children okay because they say that who is going to provide for them because my earning is limited but do you have right to do that no that's why he said kill not your children for fear of poverty we provide for them for you surely such a killing is a great sin so it is addressed to both the children islam requires parent to give the children beautiful names take proper care of them take care of all their needs provide for them reasonably in accordance with the parents income otherwise they are unsurable and ensure a decent respected and honorable life for them and the authentic prophetic tradition says bukhari para number 1407 and muslim source 593 verily allah has prohibited for you to be disobedient and ungrateful to your mothers or to bury your daughters alive you see how many hardly few references i am giving you where there is much stress upon not to bury your children had there been feticide facility then they would have even female feticide would have been common since they were only thing is they were digging a grave and uh, they were just pushing their live daughters and then covering up 
how horrible the practice was among the Arabs during that time pre-Islamic era. When I told that uh, parents required to give their children beautiful names, I'll tell you, can you, I don't know whether any of you or quite few of you may be aware, in Maharashtra, uh, quite just a few years back, there was a, we learned that there was a practice of calling any girl child born, her name was Nakushi. Those who are from Maharashtra, they know Nakushi is don't want. The, the meaning itself is don't want. We don't want you. We, we hate you, sort of, we don't want you. Every child in particular area, I'm forgetting that uh, state and the village, all girls were Nakushis. In the school, their name was Nakushi. So like Vibhuti Patel, our great feminist, women activists from Bombay, they group. All of them, they went and started interviewing and many girls were hiding their faces. We have the video. And uh, one of my, you know, like friends from IT, he met this, uh, um, what you call documentary, we can say docudrama, and he collected all that interviews, going to the schools, you know, the girls feeling so embarrassed to say, what's your name? Nakushi. Then Vibhuti and all went and renamed the girl children. Imagine that you don't want to name your girl child with any Sita, Gita, Maryam or anything. Now come to another example. Uh, one of my colleagues in uh, Lucknow, she said she's still working, uh, very much young girl. She had gone, she's a professor of education. She said that we have to go in the interior of Maharashtra or I think Maharashtra. And there the school she was sitting and then because of the project or whatever the work she had in school, she was sitting with the headmaster or the school teachers. Then enters the women to, you know, like um, admission to the children, covering their head and a half face and all that. I said, okay, father's name, okay. What's a child's mother's name? She said, nothing. She just nodded her head. Said, tell me, what's your name? You are mother of the child? Yes. What's your name? She said, no. He said, tell me your name. Why don't you have a name? He said, no, I don't have. Can you believe this day? This practice is all. I said, we girls do not have even ever given a name. So what do they call? Just like, uh, you know, wo a ye a, just like that, kali gori or anything. They just call us. There was no need fail to give us a name. This is 20th century India media. See the treatment. In what way we have tried to oh, try to end practices, in human practices like sati or girl child marriages or widow sufferance or widowhood or we may have stopped many more like Devdasi's system maybe. But some new things are coming up, you know, which needs really to be probed and then addressed. Why we see still the uh, the the historical practices still alive which which really keeps peeping from the ashes you know of the past still they are alive very much and giving the glimpses into our past that how women were treated and are still treated certain what you call you know uh, appendages are remain in our society even today or maybe that we are we are we are inventing some new methods uh, to negate our uh, girl children, you know, like we don't want them. We want them as a sex objects. We want them only as reproductive objects, but nothing more, nothing less. Thus, they have the right of blood money if killed. See, let us go back. I'm coming to front and then going back. So what was in history then the Islamic, pre-Islamic era? They have the right of blood money. Women have right today the blood money if killed as it is reported by Aisha, the prophet's companion, the wife. He said two women from Udrail tribe, you know, one of the tribes, they fought. And one three were stoned and killed another woman who was happened to be pregnant. I mean, there was a, there was a child in her womb. So the prophet, they approached for judgment. And what he said, you have to give the, 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 the you know, the women who killed this lady deserves blood money. She need to pay. If she is a slave boy or girl, 
blood money of the women, that is, 100 she camels want to be paid for the clansmen, whether she was a slave or whatever a girl she is. But this lady who killed her, she had, uh, she was supposed to give, she was made to give 100 she camels to her clansmen. That means, like you think that a male, only a victim deserves blood money? No. A woman at individual level, she enjoys all the rights as men enjoy. This is in our reference book, Bukhari, chapter number 3512, and Muslim, chapter 1681, I mean, uh, para number. The right of females to seek the knowledge. If I want to go to university, school, colleges, or anywhere, there is a strong hadith, we call it. Learn, even if you have to go to China. That means they did not say only women go to China and learn or men go to China and learn. It is addressed to both, you know, Muslim men and women seek knowledge. It's not different from for the males or for the female. That male should learn science and technology and women should go to madrasa. Nothing like that. They are addressed equally seek knowledge we have a, we have a chapter in quran which say learn learn you know there's so much stress is given in quran the first verse which was revealed to prophet muhammad was that means start learning seeking knowledge is mandatory for every muslim it is the code i'm giving from al -Bahaki. Muslims as used here, including both males and females, not only Muslim males. It is such a misconstrued idea that females are not supposed to learn. It is reflected in census of India too. The Muslim females are so backward that you can say they are placed by a sitter committee below, below the SCST as a whole. So they are such backward educationally, economically, politically, they are voiceless. So do you think that this is reflective of the religion? Often they try to attribute it to Islam. I'm sorry to say it has nothing to do because I'm quoting you to, from Quran and real resources from our hadith that, that do only two things which we go access, we, 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 we revisit every time the real resources or the prophet's life, which for us is an ideal life. We go back to him, revisit his life. When it comes to marriage, now that you saw, seek knowledge. Then it comes to marriage, which is very, very important. That today it is much in vogue, the discussion on triple talaq and multiple marriages. I ask right now to the group, can you identify but the census has given the number of male who have entered into multiple marriages, Muslims. If it is a, as a right you talk that Muslim marry multiple times, how many, please give the example in India, how many of them have entered into more than one. It is the monogamy. I'll tell you one verse from chapter two, chapter one or two, that there is a clear cut binding rider on a male. See, if few men are, like few girls also, I believe, interested or they are not satisfied with one companion in marriage, they would like to or sometimes they are compelled to, you know, fall forward in love with another woman. If religion doesn't permit you to legally bring her home, you'll start illegal physical relation. There are many, many around us where we are working around, we see in the society that they are keeping illegal relation. Children are born out of wedlock and they have no status. The woman is treated very badly as others, Simon de Boa. So if religiously you marry and bring her home, then she deserves what the respect she deserves as a wife with all the rights and responsibilities. That is more I support. If you are instead of keeping an extramarital relations with no status to that woman. It is better that marry and bring her home. I told you that uh, prior to Islam, 
they were all feminizing their many type of relations, multiple mates at a time in marriage. They had, there was no status given to such women at all. No property rights or nothing. There was no recognition, identity and dignity as a wife. But you were sex slaves, that's all. So Islam gave you permission to marry, if you so desire, more than one. There is a comma. Please, please remember. I'm quoting. There is a comma. Then it says, if only you can maintain justice. Can you... Ask any man, right, if you're listening to me, can you be justified with two women, three women, four women? You can't. You go to the younger one, you go to the one you have married recently, to the fairer one, to the younger one, or to the one you fell in love and married and brought. So you cannot maintain justice. When Quran says you marry more than one, maintain justice, then full stop. There is no full stop, right? One more verse is there, which says... One more part of the verse. Then stop at one. That means monogamy is strongly recommended to you. So what is the says? Stick to one. Don't go for more than one if you cannot maintain justice, which is in humanly impossible. Otherwise, God is watching you. He will be punishing you in case you create ingest between the wives. So when it comes to marriage, the Quran clearly indicates that marriage is sharing between the two halves of the society. H-A-L-V-E-S, halves. And that its objectives besides perpetuating human life are emotional well-being and spiritual harmony. How many households you see? Its basis are love and mercy. Among the most impressive verses in Quran about marriage is the following. And among his signs is this, that he creates mates for you from yourselves, that you may find rest with. What is it? He created mates for you from yourself that you may find rest, peace and mind in them. Peace of mind in them. And he ordained between you love and mercy. Lo, here in indeed are signs for people who reflect. That is important. Quran chapter 30 verse 2, 21. So what is that? Here indeed are signs for people who reflect. If you cannot, then you are a jahid. You are an illiterate, you are a fool if you are not understanding the word's meaning. According to Islamic law, Muslimic jurisprudence, women cannot be forced to marry anyone without their consent. Please, my friends, remember, not my brother, nor my father, nor anybody Tom, Dick and Harry force me to marry without my consent. That's why you have in the Nikah Nama compulsory registration of marriage in the presence of two witnesses. No marriage which gets solemnized without a khasi, without the presence of two relatives who is not my father, who is not my brother. They come very late, but the, my close relatives may be my own father's brother mother's brother, they are the preferred witnesses. And along with Khasi, they come to me first to the bride, not to the groom. They come to the bride, ask Ijab, we call it Ijab, are you ready to marry this guy whose age is this, who is ready to pay you dower of this time, in kind or cash or whatever, are you ready to marry him? She can well say no, put a signature over there if you are educated to thumb impression on the Nikana. Without that, there is no marriage. And if it is forced, it is not marriage. That's why, that's why I said, be carefully listening to me. That will really open your eyes. If you are not following that, that means it does not reflect your Islam. You are not following Islamic true spirits.
Ibn Abbas, companions, very close. I mean, he is Chacha, he is companion. Reported, Chacha is a A girl came to messenger of Allah, Muhammad, and she reported that her father had forced her to marry without her consent. Please listen to this, this real story, what happened during his life. That's why Prophet Sallallahu life is for us an ideal. We go revisit, you know, back and forth, back and forth whenever we have problem. If we have an issue, how to solve this. Ibn Abbas reported that a girl came to Messenger of God and she reported that her father had forced her to marry without her consent. The Messenger of God gave her the choice between accepting the marriage or invalidating it. This was reported in Ibn Hanbal, para number 2469. So what happened? In another version, the girl said, see, what did the girl say? Actually, I accept this marriage, I had no problem. But why I wanted to let women know that parents have no right to force a husband on her. Ibn Maja, number 1873. What did she say? I had absolutely no issue at all marrying that guy. Since my father forced upon, I wanted to set in an example and give to the girls of Islam this message that parents have no right over us to marry us off to anybody. That's why I approached Prophet and I tried to refuse this. I made it very clear to the parents that you cannot impose upon me. If today they are not following, this is the fault of the patriarchal society, not Islam. Besides all other provisions for her protection at the time of marriage, it was specifically decreed that women has the full right to her mahar. Mahar is dower, a marriage gift. Please remember it's a gift which is presented to her by her husband and is included in the nuptial contract, our marriages are contract. And that such ownership does not transfer to her father or husband. My father has no right, my husband has no right to her. That means this is going to be my proprietary rights, what my husband gives me as a gift, which is decided by my parents and me, that what Meher I am ready to marry this man. The concept of Meher in Islam is neither an actual or symbolic prize for the women. Usually people call it, you know, prize, you know, bright prize. Please refuse this word. Are we saleable goods to say that it is bright price? Historically, it is used as bright price. We are not prized goods. It is the gift. It is something like, you know, my husband has gifted me because I am entering into his life. It is a marriage gift. It is never as a bright price. And it is bright price since you are what you call uh, daan, katiya daan. You are giving in daan. Once you give in daan, you never take it back. This is some few words. We are we have to make it problematic. This was the case in certain cultures during pre-Islamic era that bride price was given. That means once for all, the women had lost her rights over parental home, but rather. It is a gift symbolizing love and affection. When I give gift today to girl, today is her birthday. When I'm giving a gift, that symbolizes love and affection. It is not like, you know, it is the price. Neither symbolize, you know, it is the actual or symbolic price for you. This is something like one should understand. But today, you see in most of the household, hair is not given, but dowry is given in lakhs and crores. This is part of the acculturation process in history. We know it very well. As the women's rights decide about her marriage is recognized, so also her right to seek an end of an unsuccessful marriage. Do you know that? I have right to dissolve my marriage. No, you do not know. I'm not happy. I will approach that uh, I want to, I'll approach Khazi, I'll ask for without any retributes. But why I'm not going, like me, me, many women are not going, because a shame is attached to that. 
marriage is considered for seven generation because we are staying with our hindu uh, friends around hindu brethren around their culture says that marriage is for lives in future too that a culturation part of it whereas i'm telling you quoting from quran chapter 2 verse number 229 and chapter 33 49 verse the quran state that what is say when the continuation of the marriage relationship is impossible for any reason men are still taught to seek a gracious for it end of it they have to seek gracious end for it not jute mar ke hodiyo do badiyo do or they 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 try to kill her burn her kick her that's how much the torture her then they leave her no with ahsan tariqa they used ahsan that is gracious and if you cannot adjust it is but human you cannot adjust come out of it gracefully the quran states in such cases when you divorce women they reach their prescribed term that is 4 months 10 days that is the iddat period waiting period lest she may be pregnant so let us wait to prove her pregnancy or not she will have to wait for 4 months 10 days and after that she is free to marry so when you divorce women and they reach their prescribed term then retain them in kindness and retain them not for injury so that you transgress the limits that means if you want to reproach them the talaq has of two types one is talaq bain talaq rajai if you want to reproach within after one talaq you can approach her accept her with kindness if you do it every tohar time every after periods of yours like when you have periods when you are clean he has to utter another talaq in three sittings in three periods of time your menstrual periods after completing when you are clean then only he can utter that means 90 days of waiting period is there under one roof why because lest you may develop love towards her out of anger you may say talaq once that i am divorcing you but god has given you enough time to reproach her don't cause her injury because you are transgressing the limits otherwise and you are answerable to god quran chapter number 2 verse number 231 quran chapter 2 229 verse quran chapter 33 verse 49 how many places i am giving only three here where it says warn the mankind to avoid any type of harshness in your treatment towards women according to islamic law women's right to her money real estate property or other properties is fully acknowledged i am professor i am earning i have every right on my earning i have full 100% right i don't have to run family i don't have to give to my husband i don't have to bring provision of course it is not happening with you and me we are rather running the houses then who should run the family it is the responsibility of the men to provide take care provide for the education for welfare of not only his immediate family but to the you know like wives of the deceased within close relatives father sister may be mother's mother may be or whoever dependent women in the close knit kinship family you have to take care these are the responsibilities of a true muslim man whereas owning and property rights whatever property i make these are the rights of my own self i have huge rights no responsibility to take care or run the family it may not be happening that is the fault of the family fault of the man of the husband or father or brothers who are not giving me but religion has given me on that when you say that the property rights have half of your brother because brother has huge responsibility to take care of provide for the family to the children to the relatives he is responsible towards their welfare that's why i am the man is a notch above a notch above my status because i have only rights nobody can snatch away my earning my education my rights are preserved my earning is reserved 
my property, what I get my father from my father. If my husband gives, my heart is mine. My earning is mine. My son has to give a property right to me. Ah, part of the property. Altogether, my right is more than my brother. So this right undergoes no change, whether she's single or married. She retains her full rights to buy, sell, mortgage, lease, any or all her properties. It is nowhere suggested in the law that a woman is a minor simply because she's a female. No way. It is also noteworthy that such right applies to her property. Before marriage, as well as to whatever she acquires thereafter, I don't have to carry my husband's name in my name or in my property. To whomever I want to give. When I visited Arab, I was observing. On the mosque, there was a woman name. On the houses, huge houses where I was staying in on rent. It was huge women's name. I asked, you know, how come this, my, I mean, my nephew was the tenant. I said, how this house has women's name and the mosque has women's name. They said, whatever the dower amount they get, they invest in property. They, they construct mosques, they construct on charity, they give some buildings. So this is what every right I have on my property. And here are in reality, you see many such cases of, you know, huge violence in the name of property, snatching away, kicking her out. Not only Muslim, I'm telling you, everywhere, you know, irrespective of caste and religion, women are so badly treated. Of course, there are good men. Of course, there are huge, very pious men uh, who are doing, you know, uh, their uh, good deeds and they're treating their women. I'm talking about, uh, you know, a common man uh, and the men who are really, we see, we see, we happen to see as part of statistics where we see that violence is there in those families. And though their faith is Islam, how come that they contradict? It is such a contradiction. It is there because neither they know religion, neither the women know their rights. Because it is in Arabic, they never read. Translation is available. They should go. The empowerment of women happens when they learn the, uh, you know, like context of Islam properly read and then learn the rights. Unto men, again, I am quoting from Quran chapter 4, verse number 7. Unto men of the family belongs his share of that which parents and near kindred leave, and unto women a share of what which parents and near kindred leave. That means women and men have a, a share in the property what parents leave or what relatives leave. Both men and women have, whether it be a little or much, a determinate share. Determinate share is there, which is very, very clearly mentioned in chapter two and chapter four. How to break the property? I think chapter two. It is very clearly mentioned. What share should go to whom? And then women have clear cut denomination of the share in the relatives' property in the parental property. Her share in most cases is one of the uh, one half of the man's share. I told you the reason that she has huge responsibilities, whereas women have no responsibility. Friends, I'll tell you when it comes to responsibilities or rights of women, Islam has given so huge rights for women. A mother can say no to breastfeeding or say pay for my feeding your child and that means she can claim the price for the service she is rendering to the child of the man that means she can claim the price of the breastfeeding this much right a woman has understand my point to responsibilities are not much just to safeguard the house and then cook and do Go work outside. You are earning, sir. You are earning. Nobody said don't do that. Only thing is piety and moral upgradation, which everyone says that stand by it. With no implication that she is worth half a man. Please remember when half of the man share you are getting, it doesn't imply. People usually consider it. It is that your worth is half of man's. No. The variation in any written right is only consistent with the variation in financial responsibilities of man and women according to the Islamic law. What are the responsibilities financial men has huge? Provider he is after God. 
but you have zero responsibility is financial man in islam is fully responsible for the maintenance of his wife his children and in some cases of his needy relatives especially the females widows or deserted or deceased whose husbands are dead there is this responsibility is neither waived, neither waived nor reduced because of his wife's wealth or because of her access to any personal income gained from work this doesn't depend neither it is waived off because your wife is earning she's a professor she's a doctor so your property is reduced it is utterly a sin to do that many families i have seen both of you earn let us part with your share you know give it to your younger brother who doesn't work properly wrong rent profit or any other legal means if she is earning that has no effect on his gaining the right over parental property okay this is very brief abstract of the vast array of rights freedom identity and individuality of one's woman is entitled to and islamic tenets it may appear through though a utopian idea i know that because you don't see it in reality in most of the houses it may appear to you though a utopian ideology but such is the exalted position that islam provides to women wherein her rights over right right you know over uh, what you call responsibilities you know her rights over rights her responsibility r i d e s over rights her responsibilities but when one observes it looks like the majority does not fit the ideal indeed it appears the status of women in islam is theoretically exalted and but utterly deplorable in uh, you know practice so the state of so women in india particularly is uh, what you call we can say the survey has shown that they 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 they, they do not enjoy the status as is enshrined in our uh real resources i think i have taken much of your time i'll stop it i have much to speak but i'll not do that thank you so much thank you if you have any question let us talk if you are still there i'm so sorry manali i think cross the time much more um, i will no ma'am it's all right the time uh no ma'am it was absolutely very interesting and uh, thought provoking uh, i thank you very much for this uh, emphatic lecture and uh, especially for highlighting the differences we don't have questions and all because it is on youtube so Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, I would have loved the, uh, to clarify viewers, any more. Uh, the viewers can ask questions in the comment section if they wish to. Uh, but uh, right now, are there viewers at all? Are there viewers? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there were ten uh, or twelve of uh, quite a uh, a few minutes ago. I think now they have gone down, but there's still five. Maybe they six. got bored of my lecture. Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, no, definitely not. I think uh, for some other reason. And uh, uh, yes, ma'am, I have a question actually. So you were yes. talking about the, the differences between uh, text and context. Uh, so uh, is it possible that the language of the text can sometimes be confusing, and uh, the patriarchal uh, patriarchal entities will use that to their advantage and make it uh, reinterpret it in such a way that they can have stronger hold on women see most of the feminist slavic feminists are talking about uh, you know reinterpreting the whole thing they say earlier in uh, i think 9th century if i am uh, i can recollect properly there were hundreds of women who were occupied in translation of uh, you know with sources and all that real sources you have to go you know there is a huge gap uh, 5000 years or whatever it is so uh, there is a huge gap and arabic is not everybody's uh, mother tongue or language and it has many different accents colloquial expression and all that the purity of language is very very high you know quranic language when it was revealed so the only uh, difficulty is in translation so what we would uh, we always have this question ke men started interpreting it and they have given that color of patriarchal interpretation have you know and that's why um, there, there is a huge gap between the spirit of the verses and then uh, its translation what is for the public consumption it has come in many other languages because when you take from one language to another language 
you you lift it there you may lose the original meaning it happens in english it happens in german it happens but uh, apart from that i'm telling you manali there is a there is a huge problem with the culture uh, what uh, i don't know whether you read simandi boas second sex she said very a uh, strong statement she gives after observation over the period of time observing of many cultures across the globe she has come out with a statement many statement for that matter in one place she says that she is not born but becomes a woman that means we are not born like this low class low status unintelligent they call us dependent and then we are second citizen we are not born like that we are made one we are born equal the culture makes us it is see the gender is a constructed term stereotypes are constructed so also your status is constructed biologically we are equal right we both are equal we are born with equal thought power intelligence intellectual and common sense but why on the basis of our biology we have been given a position uh, which we are discriminated we are subjugated we are violated you know all this happens so what we call is you read yourself you learn quran you learn arabic read it read the good translation god cannot be discriminatory any religion which is uh, you feel discriminatory cannot be religion because he created he knows the best what is best for you he cannot be treating you discriminatory or abuse you or uh, allow men to abuse you in the name of religion so i feel more than wrong interpretation it is you the women who is not reading and not getting empowered yourself through the verses the richness of the verses and the life of the prophet was exemplary to us believe me i am very educated whatever the education you and me have apart from constitutional right when i go back revisit as a muslim the real sources there are so falsified knowledge around which is there you know like uh, when i visit i feel such a solace i feel oh yes here it is given me the privilege to be a woman make me that ma- that moment feel proud of my you know genes that i am born a woman because uh, there is that you know that uh, uh, the 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 paradise is under the feet of the mother acha why not is it the feet of the father if he is so exalted you know this all muslim belief i think even you people not muslims also that the paradise and the feet of the mother the moment she gives birth to a child the paradise automatically that means how exalted is your position yeah please yes ma'am absolutely uh, what you said is true uh, we need to uh, oh, as, as women sense. hope i could make some sense if you were continuously yes ma'am uh, very uh, it was very very uh so apt answer to my question uh because uh, yes we need to reinterpret uh we have to definitely uh, see for ourselves what is written about us or what they say is written about us we need to verify whether it is true uh because uh, we don't know whether it is true uh we have to go and read manali those- yeah, often what happened every faith uh who said that it is the uh, it is the uh, leader of the church the father uh, or uh, you know the the, the uh, what you call mullah has a right over the quran or translation and whatever he says that is final protestant has come against the catholic you remember because whatever the father said that was the final thing but in islam there is such a such a you know stress on each individual to read herself himself the quran with its meaning and i have to my my namaz my prayer cannot be you know like uh, done by my son or my husband no my husband's me no i have to carry the burden of my own sins the burden or whatever the you know like i do good deeds that also i have to carry nobody else can carry it's not like shifting the responsibility wo mara to mujhe bhi mar jana hai aun satre nanu satok be ko illa illa mahadu this is something like we have to understand that uh, how the faith gives you the individual rights where you stand 
it, if it is not found in the community, it's not the fault of the religion or faith. It is the fault of the community which has adopted a particular power structure. The power structure we have to smash. And that you can smash only with the knowledge. That knowledge has to come from the sources. Yes. Who starts uh, exactly. it from you? I, I yeah. want to thank you, especially here for, uh, you know, highlighting the difference between religion and community. A lot of times people think that religion is equivalent to community and whatever is not happening in the community is a reflection of the religion. Not at all. Yes. That is a very important... We uh, should remember that, try to analyze it properly. Be justified in that they are not. In that way... Everywhere the Islamic culture should reflect what is in Saudi Arabia, what is in Pakistan, what the practices in the Pakistan, some remote tribal areas where they marry the Quran. You know that? You, I'll tell you one thing if it is not a time. There is Quran. They want to marry. The, they, they are practicing. the marry of the eldest daughter to Quran. Why? Why? Because there are only daughters in the family. There is a huge property. They don't want to part away with the property to their younger brothers or other relatives. So once she is married to the Quran, she will remain at home as a noble lady. So the property remain at home. How about her emotions? How about her life? Is it permitted in Quran? Is it permitted in Islam? It is not. But in the name of Islam, they are doing it in Pakistan. So if it is common, if the community is the reflective of the Quran or faith, then why do you find the differences? Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Arab, Saudi Arab, everywhere you have a different reflection of it. That is culture, not religion. Exactly, ma'am. Uh, it, it was a really very wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, there's one question in the comment uh, from Guzra. Uh, okay, sorry. The, the username is Guzra Hua Zamana. Uh, I don't know the name of the person. Uh, is there any book on the rights of women in Islam? How many? How many rights of Islam? Uh, plenty, plenty of, I don't know whether I have, because my Almira is here, I'm just trying to watch. There are, uh, you know, uh, many, many uh, books. Uh, I can send you a few names. Uh, uh, if you give me your number, I can, can you give your number? Because in the comment section, I don't see it here. Can you uh, share? Yes. I request the uh, viewer to kindly post your uh, phone number or email ID uh, in the comments so that we can uh, forward you the list of the books. Please do uh, that. I'm not take... finding that chart. Uh, no, no, ma'am. It's not here yet. Uh, but uh, whenever the comment uh, comes, I will let you know so that we can yeah. give them Please the Please give me a, I'll send him the references. Yes, it's here. The number is here. I'm so happy. I hope I could make some sense through this lecture. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Because many misnomers, many misunderstandings I needed to clear here. Tell me, ma'am, what's his number? Uh, it's uh, 733-864-2942. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, what's his name? Uh, the, the name is not here, but the user ID in YouTube is Guzra Hua Zamana. Okay, okay, okay. Thik. I'll send him yes, the references. Okay, ask yes. him not to read anything at all unless we give a proper resource. Okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, he has mentioned his name as Razik. Razak or Razik, anyway. Mm, okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. So uh, once again, I want to uh, thank you for this very thought provoking and uh, uh, very wonderful lecture because uh, we don't know a lot about Islam, uh, especially being from outside. Uh, and even those, uh, even as insiders of some other religion or some other community, we have got a new perspective, not only about Islam, but about our the own community. How yeah. we have to look at a particular thing, a, a particular problem and how we have to reinterpret things. So I think we are we owe you for that. And uh, it was really very, very uh, well articulated lecture and uh, uh, very helpful to us. Uh, so we have come to the end of the lecture. I now request Ms. Nadi Kati to propose a vote of thanks.
uh thank you so much ma'am for giving such a wonderful talk uh, on the page of history enthusiasts uh, it was really a eye opener and a very interesting talk thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, giving this talk uh it's a it's really a pleasure to have you ma'am and we surely want your support and guidance in future also uh for our history enthusiasts uh, group and yeah. uh, i also thank thank you. Yeah. but the history since i do not know it was like you know for, about my own religion i thought i can talk to you and clear much of the air what is prevailing in india I, and that's what we have to, as an educated person, try to before we make a statement that what is real and what is being thrown across, you know, that is very very clear. That makes you see. We women should understand that how faith uh, patriarchs also try to use you. You have to be very careful, you know, before becoming victims of the narratives which are thrown around. We are given no voice at all, and government sometimes play with our life, saying that we are your savior, and we have to fight within the religious, uh, you know, framework, and we have to fight with the government, with the political, with a lot of people, and then we become real great victims of all these isms, you know. We want something else in India. Try to remember when Meenadi was there, or when feminism started, there was a sisterhood. We all were one. We fought for the womanhood protection of the rights of the women, and then so much like towards equality after that. But slowly, see, they gave this color of the religion, and then we are broken now completely. Our sister is broken post Babri Masjid. I wish that we still retain our sisterhood. We should understand the politics, you know, the colored politics always, and we have to be united when we are talking because as a Hindu, you are a victim. As a Muslim, I'm a victim. We have to be together to fight this power structures at work, outside, within family, also private sphere, public sphere, both the places, and that can happen only with the sisterhood if it is not broken. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's a, it was really a pleasure to listen to you. and i also thank all our audience who were active throughout the lecture i also thank the co-host of this session uh, ms manali momaya for uh, being such a wonderful uh, co-host and uh, it's a honor to uh, have you again uh, i'm repeating it ma'am on our page thank you so much acha uh, this you put it on your youtube And yes, it is already. Yes, ma'am. Do they have viewers? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we have the viewers, and uh, I and will send you the link. Public consumption. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, this is the first of its kind you started. First is mine. Ah, uh, in the women's history uh, series, yeah. this is the first lecture. Yeah, uh, please, yes, uh, please give my me some feedback if you receive. If any questions, sure, also. Okay. Definitely, ma'am. We will forward It the questions. It is available to... on which portal? YouTube. History. Enthusiasts. Yes, ma'am. On YouTube. Okay. Let me check because there are so many patriarchies around. Me. Some may not like, some may like it, but like to get enriched by their questions and by their clarity. Okay. Thank you so much, young girls. Let us have some time later. Maybe we'll be meeting soon on ninth. I am arriving. You have a conference on eight, nine, tenth, or nine, tenth, eleventh. Uh, eight, eight, nine, nine ten, 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 ten. I'll be there on eight, ten. Okay. I'll okay. See you. Yes. I'll be picked up. I don't know where sure, the hotel is. Sure, ma'am. Bye. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are waiting to meet you, ma'am.